Hello, I'm Mike Bishop from the University of California, San Francisco, and I want to continue uh, with my second chapter in my story about cancer. At the end of the first chapter, we had reached a sound conclusion that all cancer arises from the malfunction of genes. And we had identified two culprits, genes we know as proto-oncogenes, which suffer gain of function in cancer cells that essentially become jammed accelerators, and tumor suppressor genes, which suffer loss of functions as if they were a failed break. And these combine to give rise to the malignant phenotype. Now, in order to apply this insight, we need to have a complete inventory of cancer genes, a complete catalog for each form of human cancer. And then with that catalog, we need to distinguish what we call the drivers, genetic damage that is contributing to the malignancy from passengers, collateral damage, if you wish. There are rules uh, established for doing this, but it still seems a daunting task. But it's less daunting than it used to be because of dramatic advances uh, in DNA sequencing as uh, illustrated by this plot. Um, the cost has come down many orders or orders of magnitude. It's now possible to sequence all the protein coding regions of a human genome. We call that the complete exome sequence for about $1,500. That's the cost of an MRI exam uh, in a hospital. And there's been a similar dramatic increase in the speed of sequencing to the point where first-rate sequencing facilities can now sequence a complete human genome in a week or so. In order to achieve the inventory with this dramatically improved technology, an International Cancer Genome Consortium has been formed, uh, and its objectives are ambitious. 500 genomes, full genome sequences, for each of 50 tumor types, 25,000 full genome cancer sequences. What's the state of play? Well, as of when the, uh, the, the time I'm recording this, there have been several hundred complete genome sequences for human cancer recorded, and the number is increasing by the day very rapidly. And there have been at least 2,000 complete exome sequences uh, uh, reported. So it's still early days, but we can draw some provisional conclusions. First of all, there are clearly numerous mutations in most human cancers. The numbers can be as high as 100,000 or more, although some cancers have many fewer. But among all those mutations, there are a few that create anywhere from 5 to 20 drivers per tumor. There are many more passengers, and all told, there are at least 400 different drivers identified to date. 400 different genes which either suffer gain or loss of function uh, in the production of tumors. And experimental work with mice suggests that the repertoire of drivers could exceed 2,000, 10% or so of the entire human genome. <clears throat> A few, two important principles are emerging from this provisional data. Uh, first of all, um, <clears throat> there are distinctive but not entirely unique genetic fingerprints for each type of cancer. There is overlap uh, from one type of cancer to another in the lesions, uh, but there are also uh, distinguishing features. And secondly, these numerous drivers, 400 or more, represent a far more limited number of cellular circuitry, circuits. Uh, th this, is a, this is a fact that will become important when we consider the feasibility uh, of using this knowledge in therapeutics. Let me illustrate uh, this principle of circuitry uh, with the example of pancreatic cancer. Uh, genome sequencing ha has revealed uh, that there are 12 functions or circuits affected uh, in cancer of the pancreas. But when sequences from two different cell lines derived from two different uh, pancreatic cancers uh, were compared, it was discovered uh, that the, these 12 circuits were affected by mutations in different genes between the two uh, cell lines. Uh, there was only one example, the RAS gene, 
uh, which was mutated in the two cell lines representing the RAS signaling pathway that's inevitably affected in pancreas cancers. In other words, if you're thinking about therapy, you will not necessarily think about the mutations in individual cancers such as these two here, but rather the pathways uh, that the mutations share. Now as this information accumulates, we are beginning to see how it will be useful in almost every aspect of the study of cancer and the clinical management of the disease. Uh, it's going to help us identify causes, an urgent need, genetic risk. It help us improve early detection. It's, it is already transforming the classification of cancer, revealing new subtypes in lymphomas and breast cancers and others. It's going to help in the prognosis, the prediction of outcome. It's going, it is already inspiring new therapeutics, as I will explore in detail in my third chapter. It's going to allow us at least to attempt the personalization of therapy, the individualization of therapy. The rapid evaluation of individual responses, we, we may be able to evaluate whether the tumor is responding in a matter of days rather than months. And it is going to simplify and economize uh, uh, for uh, clinical trials. I'm going to examine a number of these uh, uh, by way of illustration. First of all, what causes cancer? Um, th this is a crucial question because we need to know the answer before we can devise prevention. And it represents one of the most, well certainly what is to my eye, one of the most difficult forms of cancer research. Now, for some few major cancers, we know with some certainty at least one cause. Cancer of the cervix is caused by infection with a virus, human papillomavirus. Cancer of the liver is caused by infection with either of two viruses, hepatitis B virus or hepatitis C virus, uh, and or by toxins, uh, such as those found in contaminated foods. Cancer of the lung, uh, much of it is caused by uh, cigarette smoke. Cancer of the skin, you heard me say, is caused by sunlight, by ultraviolet light in the sunlight. And most cancer of the stomach is caused by a bacterial infection. But many of our other major cancers remain without an established major cause, and they are big killers. Breast, prostate, colon, ovary, pancreas, brain. We have nothing but hunches uh, about what might cause these cancers. Now, <clears throat> the tools for discovery here are of two sorts. One is guilt by association, also known as epidemiology. And the other, uh, are is represented by our newfound genomic tools. And they allow us to do two things. They allow us to detect the presence of previously unrecognized microbes, either viral or bacterial. And they can also reveal lesions in DNA that hint at the nature of the causative agent. I'll illustrate each of these briefly. Perhaps the best example of and particularly successful example of guilt by association involves cancer of the liver. This map uh, has been known for many years. It displays the incidence of chronic hepatitis B virus infection around the world. Quite some years ago, medical scientists looked at this map and realized that it could be superimposed on the distribution of liver cancer. This led to more sophisticated epidemiological studies that clearly established that infection with hepatitis B virus, chronic infection in particular, uh, was at least one of the causes of liver cancer. We now have an even more uh, profound uh, uh, proof of that because we have a vaccine against hepatitis B virus which is being widely used and is clearly having an impact on the incidence of cancer in those areas uh, where the disease has been particularly common. Now, what do these genomic tools do for us? Well, first of all, they can help us detect uh, previously unrecognized viruses. There are three examples, and they represent 
uh, progression from a, uh, an unsophisticated uh, molecular technique to full genome sequencing. The, the first of these was a discovery that uh, all cervical cancers contain a previously unrecognized strain of human papillomavirus. This virus was detected with very simple techniques of molecular hybridization. Then the Kaposi sarcoma sarcomavirus was identified uh, by a somewhat more sophisticated technique of molecular hybridization. And the most recent and very rare uh, example is so-called Merkel cell carcinoma virus. This was literally detected by full genome sequencing. Then there's the idea that we can deduce or at least get a hint about the cause of a cancer from the nature of the chemical damage in DNA. And the premier example is skin cancer, uh, which we already uh, were reasonably certain is due mainly uh, to ultraviolet light in sun, in sunlight. But in uh, the skin tumors, a, a tumor suppressor gene known as TP53 characteristically has a particular change in which just two nucleotides, the, a pair of C's, is converted to a pair of T's. This is a hallmark of damage from ultraviolet light. This is a stunning affirmation of our belief that sunlight has a crucial role in the genesis of skin cancer. Uh, there are other examples. Uh, the genetic damage in lung cancer reflects the nature of the chemicals in cigarette smoke. The genetic damage in liver cancer can reflect uh, the nature of the toxins uh, that might have been involved in the genesis of the cancer. And finally, in the tragic cases where secondary cancers arise as a result of vigorous chemotherapy, the DNA damage there is diagnostic of the chemicals that were used in the therapy. The principal point of learning the cause of cancer, of course, is to devise preventions. In the last, we have only a few of those. We can prevent most lung cancer by avoiding tobacco smoke. We can certainly reduce the incidence of skin cancer by avoiding excessive exposure to sunlight. We have a vaccine for hepatitis B virus, which is reducing the incidence of liver cancer. And we now have a vaccine for human papillomavirus, which when widely applied, will certainly reduce the incidence uh, of uh, cervical cancer, particularly in those developing nations where it is uh, particularly uh, common and a, a, a common cause of death uh, among women. Uh, when you think of the genome and cancer, um, it's inevitable that you wonder about the possibility of predicting individual risk of cancer. And there are three basic origins of risk. There's the environment, sunlight, for example. There's behavior, cigarette smoking, for example. And there's inherent inheritance. And with the advent of uh, uh, genome uh, sequencing, with the advent of modern genomics, uh, genes have come front and center. There are two kinds of genetic risk for cancer. There, are, uh, th there is a strong risk due to single gene changes that is responsible for perhaps 5 to 10 percent of all cancer. And the, retinoblast the example of retinoblastoma I gave you is one, uh, and we will talk about a few others momentarily. Then th there are multiple genes, um, each of which may be making a weak contribution to risk, possibly for all cancers. Uh, these are being identified uh, at a uh, considerable pace. There are many of them. The question remains as to whether this will ever be useful information because the risk attributed to any single uh, change is, is relatively small. Suffice it to say, it's a work in progress. But we do have a few strong cancer genes that are responsible for inherited cancer and for which we will do genetic testing if it's indicated. It includes the retinoblastoma gene, uh, the two BRCA breast cancer and ovarian cancer genes, and a gene called APC, a deficiency of which is responsible for polyps and cancer of the colon. Let me illustrate the APC problem. Um, 
This is a normal colon. And this is a colon taken from a patient who has inherited a deficiency in the APC tumor suppressor gene. It is a sheet of polyps. And some of these polyps will inevitably progress to cancer. It's clear that testing families that have this problem for the presence of the APC deficiency uh, is a valuable approach uh, that can help uh, in the prevention of disease in the individual members of the family. Unfortunately, that prevention usually involves a complete resection of the colon. Early detection uh, is known to be valuable uh, in uh, improving the outcome from uh, uh, cancer therapy. And genomics is allowing us uh, to improve early detection. Now, the established techniques are only four uh, in nature, in number. Uh, the renowned PAP test, um, which was extraordinarily effective in reducing the incidence of cervical cancer, it may someday be replaced by the testing for the presence of the causative agent, the DNA of the human papillomavirus. Uh, then there's colonoscopy, which is an effective means of early detection, but also obviously a burdensome technique. Mammography for breast cancer, about which there some controversy is presently swirling. And the PSA test for prostate cancer, which is deeply mired uh, in controversy and under uh, thorough reconsideration. This is not, uh, this is hardly where we would like to be with early detection. And it's possible, uh, for example, we don't have validated tests uh, for any of these major killers, lung cancer, ovary, pancreas, or liver. There is no test available to detect these tumors early uh, in their genesis. We may get a help from what can be called molecular cytology. Um, the human body sheds cells uh, into all of its uh, orifices, into the colon, into breast fluid, uh, into uh, the secretions from the cervix and uterus, and the bladder, or the, uh, or the kidney, both coming out in the urine, and, and, and in the sputum of the lung. And these cells can be analyzed uh, for the presence of telltale genetic lesions, lesions that would hint at a future cancer or the presence of an existing cancer. And I want to illustrate this with a story of Hubert Humphrey, the American statesman, who died in 1978 uh, from bladder cancer. Uh, he, st he first knew he had a problem in 1967 uh, <clears throat> when he had a problem with his bladder that his physicians deemed not malignant. In 1973, they decided, yes, he might have a mild form of bladder cancer, and they used local therapy. In 76, they realized they were dealing with a highly malignant disease. Radical surgery was performed. It was too late. Mr. Humphrey died in 1978 from bladder cancer. Some years, uh, some years ago, scientists went back and looked at the specimens uh, from Hubert Humphrey that had been preserved and discovered that from the very outset, the tumor suppressor gene, TP53, had, was mutant. In other words, molecular cytology done at this point in Hubert Humphrey's course would have alerted the physicians that they were dealing with a truly uh, dangerous circumstance and they could have taken aggressive action at that point, uh, 11 uh, years before uh, Hubert Humphrey's uh, ultimate death. This is a dramatic illustration of what molecular cytology might offer us uh, and there are vigorous efforts underway to make it a reality. How about prognosis? Both patient and physician want urgently to know what they can expect uh, from the disease itself uh, and from the therapeutic that they might receive. The first example of how gene analysis uh, uh, might help with prognosis remains one of the most powerful. Uh, and it, came, it, it, it emerged uh, in the early 80s, not too long after the discovery or at least the solidification of the uh, uh, reality of uh, genetic damage in cancer. Uh, <clears throat> It, it, it involves a gene known as MYC-N, which was originally discovered by virtue of the fact that it is amplified. It is overgrown, sometimes a hundred or a thousand fold 
in neuroblastomas, uh, a tumor of children. Uh, a large uh, national study was conducted. The first uh, purpose was simply to ask whether uh, guilt by association applied here, whether that amplification was common enough in neuroblastoma to be uh, part of the um, mechanism of tumor genesis. But a very useful outcome occurred when it was realized that the presence or absence of the amplification of this gene had a profound prognostic uh, it was a profound prognostic indicator. Uh, <clears throat> and that's dramatized in this plot. Children whose tumors do not contain uh, an amplification of MCN have a superb outcome uh, after therapy. Children in which, uh, whose tumors have MCN amplified are going to be refractory to conventional therapies. Uh, this test is now uh, used at all major centers uh, where neuroblastoma is handled and it remains the most powerful uh, predictor based on genes uh, for the moment. But we have a, uh, more sophisticated techniques and uh, they are going to change the, the game. Uh, th this will be recognized by many of you uh, <clears throat> as what we call uh, a gene array analysis. Uh, simply put, uh, it is now possible to, uh, to test for the expression of every gene in the human genome. And in this array, the red squares indicate a gene that's active and the green uh, squares indicate a gene that's at normal level or even not active. And this can be used to survey um, or to compare gene expression in cancer cells uh, with gene expression in normal cells. And let me give you one example, which is actually commercially available, and it's known as MammaPrint. Um, this is uh, a set of 70 genes, uh, which uh, it comp comprises a fingerprint. Uh, and if that fingerprint is present, uh, the, it, it, the likelihood of a poor outcome uh, is, is increased. Now, this is not perfect. Uh, <clears throat> The accuracy, uh, uh, prognostic accuracy, is only about 50%. Uh, and the mammoth print is found in about 61% of breast cancers. There is another signature known as the MSP complex. That signature alone has about a 60% prognostic accuracy, but it only occurs in 14% of human breast cancer. If you put the two together, you get a, remar a, a remarkable improvement in accuracy, 82%. But now, the number of patients, the number of tumors, the fraction of tumors containing the combined signature is down to 9%. So that's a discouraging limitation on the most effective prediction, but it is also a dramatic reflection of how much more complex breast cancer may be than we had previously realized. In other words, that 9% represents a distinct biological and genomic subset of the disease that has not previously been recognized. Which brings us to therapy, which is always uppermost, uh, uh, or usually uppermost, in the, in the, in the public mind. Um, in using genetic lesions in cancer to guide our development of therapies, we are designing an intervention in the elaborate circuitry that controls the lives of our cells. And this, this is a simplification of that circuitry. Uh, the real thing is hundreds, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of fold more complex. And represented at, uh, by the red dots are nodes in this circuitry where either a proto-oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene resides. And <clears throat> we, would, we would like to target our therapeutics to those nodes that are malfunctioning in the cancer cell. The two obvious ways to do this uh, are either to inhibit a gain of function of a proto-oncogene or replace the loss of function of a tumor suppressor gene. Inhibiting gain of function is something we know how to do and you'll hear a lot more about that from me in my third chapter. It is, as I like to say, a growth industry. Replacement of function is not presently practicable. We simply have no means by way to do that at the moment or, in my view, for the foreseeable future. 
And then there's a third newly emerging technique called attack, I call it attacking from the flank, in which neither the cancer gene itself nor its protein product is the direct target for therapy. But that the cancer gene or its protein product is nevertheless being exploited in the therapy, and this will be a major subject of my third chapter. <clears throat> what do we target then? Well, we target proteins, not genes. We target proteins with both pharmaceuticals, small molecules, and biologicals, large molecules like antibodies. We do this now in many instances, and we'll be doing it more in the future. We don't target genes because the molecular surgery on tumor DNA, or for that matter, normal DNA, is not yet practicable. Just we have no way uh, of doing that. Now the poster child for targeted therapy of cancer um, is a gene, uh, is a drug with the um, trade name Gleevec, or the formal name imatinib. And it has been developed and is extraordinarily effective against patients with chronic myeloid, myeloid leukemia containing the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, this is the translocation I told you about in my first lecture. And what this translocation does is to create a sort of mongrel protein with portions of two different proteins fused. The action uh, of this protein is enzymatic in nature. And the fusion, the mongrel version of the protein, this enzymatic activity is incessantly and excessively on. It cannot be controlled. And that is one of the driver, it, perhaps the principal driver, in the production of this tumor. Some years ago, uh, a group of scientists, uh, both academic and commercial, uh, teamed up to develop uh, this, ke this chemical known as Gleevec. And uh, they developed it by screening for chemicals that could kill or arrest the growth of uh, leukemia cells in the laboratory. And the efficacy in patients proved to be dramatic. And this is a story that's told in great detail by Brian Drucker in his iBio seminar, and I refer you to that uh, if you want to learn more about it. So here are the early returns uh, for what we call targeted therapy. That is to say, therapy that actually has a specific gene product as its target. The disease acute promyeloblastic leukemia, which was once incurable, can now be cured. And I will tell you about that in my third chapter. Breast cancer, survival can be extended by several means, the best known being Herceptin, a targeted therapy. Chronic myeloid leukemia, I just told you about Gleevec, this prolonged survival to the point that we're now calling this a chronic disease. Uh, uh, the term chronic myeloid leukemia is a bit of a misnomer because this disease is ultimately lethal as well. Now, it can, uh, patients, if patients are treated early on, uh, they have uh, an outstanding prognosis. And again, Brian Drucker's iBio seminar discusses that in detail. And we have drugs uh, that give us uh, a brief remission in lung cancer and a brief remission in melanoma. Uh, both of these are targeted therapies, uh, and they simply point the way to a much more promising future. I will discuss all of this in more detail in my third chapter. Recently, cancer scientists have realized that they have a different kind of target they may have to worry about, a distinctive cellular target. This target is known either as a cancer stem cell or a tumor-initiating cell. It appears that within the, ma the massive population of tumor cells, there is a small subset which is responsible for maintaining the larger mass. This subset uh, functions rather like a normal stem cell in that it is constantly regenerating itself, but also spinning off what you could call uh, the differentiated Kent's tumor cell. Now, these are the cells that we normally treat. These are the cells whose response we normally measure in our therapy. These are new actors in the game. Uh, there is controversy about how universal they are. They have certainly been shown to be, uh, their existence has certainly been well uh, affirmed in certain leukemias and 
There is strong evidence for them in some solid tumors as well. Suffice it to say, this too is a work in progress, but the question arises, do these cells differ from the mass of tumor cells in their therapeutic susceptibilities? Um, one reason they might is that they are known to proliferate very slowly. And the classical uh, chemotherapeutics exploit the rapid proliferation of cancer cells. So this would make these cells relatively resistant to the classical chemotherapeutics. It's possible that they have a distinctive circuitry of the sort I talked about before, which is in no way targeted by uh, a drug that we develop for the circuitry in the mature tumor cells that have been spun off from the stem cells. And thirdly, these tumors, uh, these uh, stem cells, or tumor initiating cells, often carry intrinsic uh, drug resistance. Um, and the, the reason for that is speculative, but makes sense. And that is uh, that if these cells were actually derived originally from normal stem cells, uh, normal stem cells are vital, vital to the maintenance of our adult tissues, and it would be only reasonable to think that they have, over the eons, evolved intrinsic resistance to environmental toxins of any sort, naturally occurring or more recently um, a, human, a human origin. So let's talk about resistance to cancer therapy for a moment. It takes three forms. Pumps, pumps that extrude uh, chemicals from the cell, mutations in the targets that we're treating, and peculiarities of the signaling circuitry. Now we've known about these pumps for quite some time. They're transporters that use energy to efflux uh, various chemicals and a huge array of chemicals uh, from the cell. And unfortunately, um, they often efflux the, the uh, agents that we use for treating cancer. And <clears throat> uh, this, this was the classical underpinning of much of the drug resistance against uh, conventional therapeutics. Then there's the problem of the mutation in the target gene. Now this I've illustrated here with uh, the BCR able, the mongrel protein of chronic myeloid leukemia that is normally targeted by Gleevec. And uh, this gene develops mutations under the pressure of Gleevec treatment that render the protein resistant to Gleevec and require the development of additional drugs, which has been done successfully and promises more for the future. But arrayed along this cartoon are various points uh, where mutations have been found that make the protein resistant. Uh, this is the drug binding to the protein. So some of the mutations simply impede the binding directly. Other of the mutations change the conformation of the protein in a way that makes it resistant to the therapy. This is a common occurrence for various forms of therapy of various cancers, and it's one uh, that we will uh, have to cope with even with the new elegance of targeted therapy. Then there's the peculiarities of the circuitry. Now, <clears throat> imagine uh, a tumor that has a switch here on the surface um, that uh, is a, a hyperactive proto-oncogene, a gain of function, all right? And you want to target that. But if there is also a mutation in one of the downstream signaling elements, such as the RAS gene, uh, targeting this will be of no avail because the RAS gene will still be running full tilt and driving the cancer. This has been found in human cancer as a form of resistance to drug therapy, and I'll, I'll say more about that uh, momentarily. And then here's another example of how the circuitry can undermine uh, our therapeutics. This involves the target for Herceptin in breast cancer. Uh, Herceptin is uh, an antibody that binds to the, this surface switch, this gain of function, and shuts it down. But there are other surface receptors that play on the same downstream signaling. And if they are, any of them are also hyperactive in the cancer cell, shutting down HER2 alone does not suffice 
to shut down the signaling that is driving the tumor and gives rise to Herceptin resistance. Trastuzumab is, this is, this is the fancy term, the chemical term, uh, the formal term for Herceptin. Clearly, if we have the complete genome sequence and the, and, and the full knowledge of a circuitry in a cancer cell, we can predict either this form of resistance or this form of resistance. So genomics is going to be an assist to us in dealing with this problem. <clears throat> uh, clinical trials are notorious for a number of difficulties. They need to be very large. Enrolling enough patients is a problem. It takes a long time to get the results. Genomics may offer a solution to that. First of all, as we learn what the drivers are, and as we develop therapeutics for those drivers, we'll be able to define the trial population. We will be able to restrict the population to people with the target. This will make it possible to greatly reduce the size of the cohort, uh, which will reduce the cost. And it will also probably allow us to develop what are known as biomarkers, molecular or chemical changes, that would permit us to evaluate within a matter of days whether there is a response to the therapeutic. And if we can have that kind of feedback, we can then make these trials adaptive. We can change in midstream and use the same cohort uh, to explore uh, a, a revision of the therapeutics. How many cures do we need for cancer? Well, th there's a, a public hope for a panacea, a one-stop cure-all. It's not going to be in all likelihood. I've told you that there are varied genetic fingerprints from one tumor to another. Hence, there will be no single therapeutic regimen that will deal with all cancers. There will be no single cure for cancer. Uh, we will have to, for maximum efficacy, we will have to personalize the therapy. How do we do this? Well, first of all, you have to profile the genome and gene expression in the tumor in question. Identify the potential therapeutic targets. And we may also have to deal with the problem that there are distinctive targets in cancer stem cells. This is, this is essentially um, an unknown for the moment, uh, but uh, under intense scrutiny. From the genomic data, we'll be able to know whether there's a suitable drug metabolism. Some of the drugs we use, such as tamoxifen for breast cancer, have to undergo a chemical conversion in the cell before they're effective. Uh, genomic data will tell us whether that uh, machinery is present. It will also be able to identify nascent drug resistance of the sort I described in the circuitry, for example. <clears throat> and all of this will uh, allow us to tailor uh, the therapy appropriately and in all likelihood it will always have to be combination therapy uh, and I will approach that also uh, in my third chapter. But let me dramatize this with a beginning and that involves the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer, uh, a, 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 a horrendous ailment almost inevitably uh, lethal. It was some years ago discovered uh, that there is a switch, a proto-oncogene protein product on the surface of lung cancer that is hyperactive, a gain of function, the so-called EGF receptor. Drugs to attack this receptor were developed. Uh, the trade names are Iressa and Tarceva, and these are chemical inhibitors of that switch. In the first clinical trials of these inhibitors, there was no prolongation of life. They appeared to have failed. However, in occasional patients, there were remarkable responses. Uh, this image shows one patient whose this whole entire left lung is just full of cancer. Six weeks after the initiation of treatment with Iressa, the tumor had regressed dramatically. It eventually recurred but this was a very promising response. But it was limited to only a few. Eventually we learned that it's limited to about 10% of all non-small cell carcinomas of the lung. 
and then we can identify those patients because they have telltale mutations in that switch, telltale genetic changes in the gene that encodes the EGF receptor switch, and those changes indicate susceptibility. So this is a way that we can screen all of these patients and find those that are going to respond to this drug. <clears throat> so, uh, in miniature, we are, we are personalizing the treatment of lung cancer, at least with this drug. We have to screen for the susceptible mutations. We have to screen RAS because it's downstream, if you recall, of the EGF receptor, and if it's mutant, there's no point in turning this off because that won't work. In fact, uh, the drug labeling now re uh, 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 advises not to use this drug if there is a mutation in RAS. <clears throat> so you then use these data to make your therapeutic decision. This is, in miniature, personalized therapy in the making. Now what about this immense genetic diversity that uh, <clears throat> uh, I've talked about before? Many malfunctioning genes. Well, some are relatively common and shared among different tumors, such as MYC, overexpression of MYC, such as mutation in RAS. Uh, and as I emphasized or illustrated with the pancreas cancer, there's a limited number of signaling pathways that are affected by uh, mutations in a larger number of genes, and we can focus on the signaling pathways in our thinking uh, and thereby reduce the complexity of the problem. Uh, in other words, we'll be able to expand the utility of individual therapeutics beyond what we might have expected when we first recognized that there are many malfunctioning genes in cancer cells. Uh, <clears throat> in 2010, Nature magazine polled 1,500 uh, chemic, uh, cancer scientists, uh, actually uh, medical scientists in general, <clears throat> and they asked the question, how soon do you expect personalized medicine based on human genetic information to become commonplace? And if you accept those, if you sort of include those who said it's already here with those who said within five or ten years, or 10 to 20 years, you get a large majority of these medical scientists who think that personalized medicine is going to become commonplace. There's one set of profound pessimists, those who say not in my lifetime, and I strongly suspect those are people of my age group. In March 7, 1986, the Nobel laureate Renato De Becco published an essay in Science Magazine. It was one of the first formal calls to sequence the human genome. And he used cancer to justify his argument. And in his conclusion, he said, in essence, that attention to DNA may, and this is a quote, close the chapter on cancer. Well, we haven't closed the chapter yet, but I hope that what I've told you so far has convinced you that we are turning the pages very rapidly. Thank you for listening.